and emerging as well. Um, so yeah, welcome. I started the Lunar Syndrome Association in 2016 after my son Ben received his diagnosis. Um, you know, as a parent receiving a diagnosis like that, you know, I felt a bit lost and I couldn't believe there wasn't a national or state agency or body there for people to kind of turn to for, for answers and for resources. Um, and I thought, you know, being a health professional, I was in, an I was in a unique opportunity to provide evidence-based resources for people um, to kind of fill that vacuum. So we've been going for about five years now and yeah, we, we've been able to help people not just in WA but nationally and internationally as well. Um, and yeah, it's going really well. We've got a, a large online audience joining us today as well. Uh, this is the first seminar I've ever held in WA on Noonan Syndrome and I think it's only the second nationally. Um, so I just want to thank all the staff at PCH that's made this possible today, uh, particularly Dr Colin Derrick, Dr Rachel Dwyer, um, Claire Franklin and Jacqueline Noonan. Not that Jacqueline Noonan, but our, our own little Jacqueline Noonan. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors today as well, Pfizer and Zest Photography. Uh, they've helped make today possible too. Um, we're really fortunate to be in Perth uh, and have a world-class hospital here at PCH with really dedicated professional caring staff, many of those staff who are joining us and dedicating their time today, so I want to thank them um, for their knowledge and their expertise and their time. And I also want to uh, just welcome to the podium now someone who's really made today possible and that's Dr Colin Derrick. Good morning everybody and those of you at home watching online as well. As uh, Brett said, my name is Colin Derrick, I'm one of the paediatricians and we really are just at the start of um, the whole uh, Nunan's uh, clinic which we started not that long ago um, and we combine it with other conditions called rhizopathies and we're working hard to get a dedicated clinic that's multidisciplinary. But uh, it's my job actually this morning to welcome you here on behalf of all the PCH staff um, and we are working very hard to to provide good service for people who may have fallen through the cracks in the past. People with rare diseases and their families often find it difficult to access services. Um, they often uh, find it quite taxing to get appointments for many different specialists and that's what our aim is, to provide good holistic care that's easy to access and not only that but to listen to the voice of the patient which we think is very important because most often in these type of conditions patients and families know way more than the actual doctor treating them because they've lived it and we learn more from the patients than we do from the textbooks, that's for sure. But I've gone totally off uh, my uh, uh, piece of paper that I was supposed to use and welcome you. I really hope that you have a lovely day and I hope that you learn and I hope that you can feel that you can contribute in a meaningful way and I hope that it's the first of many such uh, endeavours where we invite uh, families to participate in the process of sharing information and indeed care for their children. Um, have a lovely day. I just have to mention that the bathrooms are out to your right at the back and you turn right again. Um, I think that that's probably all I need to say about the housekeeping. We do have some tea and some lunch coming a bit later and I think other folks are joining us a bit later. Um, but it's my privilege now to introduce Kathy Poulton who is distracted right at this stage. But there she comes. Cathy is a, a very well respected a genetics uh, consultant um, working in the field of research and rare diseases. She's on the panel of the rare disease program where we look at people that have undiagnosed disease where we do our best to figure out what's wrong with them. Cathy's actually got a diagnosis named or a syndrome named after her which she encountered in research in Europe and she's been doing some amazing work at uh, Fiona Stanley Hospital on facial recognition um, with unusual patterns of facial uh, features and trying to get a big a database electronically uh, or digitally rather to try and help with diagnosis. Um, Kathy is a, a great source of knowledge and I would really welcome her to the podium to speak to you about Newman syndrome. Well, thank you for the accolade. Um, Actually, the reason that I do this job is because I love it and I love dealing with families and children who have rare diseases and really hope that we can make a difference. Um, so as Colin said, I'm from the genetics department of WA. Do I just go down? Right. Yeah. Is it through? Oh yeah. 
Okay, sorry, I just need to find my talk. Uh, no. Oh, over here. Okay, great. Thanks. Sorry, always having difficulty finding things. Let it load up. So thank you very much for asking me to be part of today and I think it's so great when parents especially can put these things together and be advocates for their children and can get all the specialists involved that are trying to be helpful and trying to be there. So one of the questions I often ask people when they come in or when they refer to us is, do you, do you know why we're here? And about 70% of the time say they don't know. <laughs> they don't know what we do, they don't know what we offer. So this is part of the talk today is really to say what we can offer to families and why we're here. So who is Genetic Services? We deal with rare disease, we deal with um, inherited or inheritable diseases or syndromes. And we're made up of a collection of people, administrative staff, genetic counsellors, clinical geneticists who are the doctors, registries including familial cancer registries, research nurses and work very closely with the laboratories. So we're actually a big team. We cover the whole of WA and we're based at King Eddie's but we come over to PCH as well and other hospitals. We're divided into three different areas, paediatrics, which is why I've been asked to talk today, um, adult and prenatal, so people who are planning a pregnancy or who are currently pregnant, and familial cancer, I should say. <clears throat> We're based at King Eddie's, but we have clinics all over the state, including we go to Jindalup, Rockingham, Geraldton, Port Hedland, Bunbury, Albany, and Kalgoorlie. One of the positive things, if I can say that, about COVID is that video call and doing things online has been much more um, freely accessible and that's something that we do actually encourage, particularly for follow-up appointments, we don't necessarily have to make you come into Perth or to your clinic. We can do that from your own home using your own device to talk with us. Genetic counsellors are a big part of our service and genetic counselling which the doctors can also provide and it's really defined as a communication process which aims to help individuals, couples and families understand and adapt to medical, psychological and implications of their genetic condition and their contribution to specific health disorders. And this is what we try and offer as a holistic approach. So we're there. So often people also bulk when I say that there's a genetic counsellor here to, to assist with the appointment or to contact you because oh, I don't need counselling. Actually, it's more a supportive way of being able to um, adapt. Why would you see genetics? Why should you come and see us? Um, we can help make a diagnosis. That's often really the first port of call when people are wondering why something's happened. And this can mean, if we can help make this diagnosis, it can mean that parents are able to find support and information that are relevant to their child uh, through support groups, like there's one today. The diagnosis may impact management and help guide other specialists or general paediatricians or GPs as to what we should do. Um, parents may also wish to know what's the chance of this happening again, of having another child who has the same condition. And we can give options for testing in future pregnancies. It may also affect other family members, either for their own health or who are starting families in the future. And we can provide emotional support for adjustment to diagnosis and coping with it. What to expect if you do get referred to us or you do want to come and see us? It's a long appointment. We spend an hour with our patients. We have an hour allocated and often we spend more, particularly if there's family members. There's a lot of talking. So if you have children with you or do say bring snacks, bring toys, do whatever you need to do, we, need to, we, we spend a long time going through things. We'll ask a lot about family history, pregnancy history, developmental history and medical history as well as other things. And we usually, when we get a referral, we will send out a form in advance and ask you to fill in the family details as much as you can to give us as much information before we get to the appointment. We, you know, in terms of how many patients we see a day, it's relatively few compared to other specialties, but that's because we spend a long time with each family and we have a lot of time before and afterwards where we're preparing for the appointment and trying to give everyone that's coming to see us the best outcome from seeing us and the most information that we can give. We would also expect to examine the person who's been referred, but also we often examine other family members that have come along as well. Taking photos is part of the consultation and it helps us in order to help not just the facial recognition, but in order to discuss with, other, with our other colleagues as to the most likely diagnosis. And sometimes it does involve a blood test. 
Hopefully in the future, I'm hoping that we go away from that and we can do more on cheek swabs and less blood tests for people, but at the moment, the blood test is really the first line. I'm not going to tell you all what Noonan syndrome is because I'm sure you all know, um, and that's why you're here and you could probably teach all of us something, but it's a genetic condition. It affects different body parts, so it's called a multi-system. It's an autosomal dominant condition, which I'll go on to. And the diagnosis can be made clinically and there are set criteria in order to help make the diagnosis. Genetic testing can confirm the diagnosis in up to 70% of the cases. But what's a really important point that we try and make to everyone is that even if the genetic test doesn't find the exact cause, it doesn't mean that you can necessarily take that diagnosis away. So it can be helpful, but it's not the be all and end all having that blood test. So this is now we go into a little bit of science. I didn't want to really go too much into this because I think it's a lot of detail and not everyone will be interested. Um, but if we're talking about genetic conditions, we're talking about DNA. DNA is our blueprint, is how we're made, is telling us how to make a person and it's in every cell of our body. And it's made up basically of letters that are A, T, C and G that are then encoded for amino acids which make up proteins which we're all made of. So what I tell people is that it's like our recipes for our body. So in every cell of our body, we have a recipe for making a person. And we all have differences in our recipes. We all have thousands of differences. I do, Colin does, everyone here does. And this is basically just trying to illustrate that, that we have the genetic code, the recipe, and it undergoes this to make a protein, which we're all made of. So we've got 20,000 recipes in our body, lots of DNA in between these recipes that we don't know what it does. It's not junk DNA, it used to be called that, but we don't know. So there's a lot of genetic information there that we don't know what it means at this point. When you get your genetic test result back, you'll get a very detailed um, description, which is basically describing the difference in the recipes, and that's what we can help explain to you as well. There are this many genes associated with Noonan syndrome at this point. The most common one is PTPN11, 50%. And then there are these other genes that have been identified. They're all part of what we call the rhizopathy pathway, which is a signaling pathway. And that's why Colin has called his clinic the rhizopathy clinic, because it's with Noonan syndrome and other related conditions. So these are the genes that we currently can test for, but we don't always get a molecular diagnosis in every single person that comes to us who we think may be living with Noonan syndrome. And that could be that there are other genes associated. It could be that our technology is not perfect. We're not able to pick up every single recipe change that's there. Or it could be that it's outside that coding region. So genetic testing is not perfect. We can do our best, but it's not perfect. This is what's available for children and adults with um, Noonan syndrome, and it's a, a recommended guideline, and this is when having a diagnosis can help, because there are specific, you don't have to read all the little detail, it's just showing that this is available and this is what we give out to other people. There are specific guidelines on surveillance, the things that should happen at a regular basis. It gives everyone a clear idea of what to expect, how to arrange appointments, what we should be expecting at each time, and they are guidelines for first diagnosis, infancy, childhood, and adulthood and also give set um, growth charts that we could expect. So, going on to pregnancy planning, which is a really big part of our job as well. Some of you in the audience online or here have, may have had a child who's been diagnosed with Noonan syndrome and then found out that you were subsequently have the condition as well, and that's quite a common scenario for us. And that can come as a bit of a shock. Um, but it also can be quite reassuring that you've been through this condition and you've had your own children. But what we do want to give is give people information so that they know for the future. What we call with this condition is we call it an autosomal dominant condition, which means that we each have two copies of those recipes that I was telling you about, and one copy will have the spelling difference on that can cause the condition, and one copy won't. When we have children, we pass on one copy of each of our recipes out of the two. And this means that if you have, for an example, a dad who has the condition, half his sperm will have the recipe change and half won't, which means there's a one in two chance of the child inheriting the condition with each pregnancy. If we, um, so when we see people who are planning a pregnancy, we are not gonna tell you what to do. 
and what to do in the future. We're going to give you the options and saying this is the chance of passing on. The condition can be really variable, even within families. Some people will be mildly affected, some people will be, have more difficulties than others, and we can't tell from the gene change necessarily where you're going to be on that spectrum. But we can tell you what you can have, what you can do in the future. So you might decide that if you are going to go for another child, that you want to have the pregnancy tested. And this is the options, this is what I'm going through, that you could have the pregnant, become pregnant naturally and have the prenatal diagnosis if you would like. You can have, or you can go through IVF that creates embryos and we do pre-implantation genetic testing. But we can only give these options if we know that exact change in the recipe. If we, have, if we don't know the change in the recipe that causes a clinical diagnosis, we can't, we can't test for it. We're not, we don't know which needle in the haystack to look for. We need to be able to know that specific spelling difference. These are the two types of options in pregnancy that we can test. One is at about 13 weeks usually, it can be a little bit earlier, which is chorionic villus sampling, which is taking a bit of the placenta on the fetal side and testing that. Um, the risk of miscarriage is about one in 500, so it's pretty low, and that's a local risk. So that's, the risk of miscarriage is different along different centers, and this is our figures that we give out locally as doing the risk of miscarriage. It takes about, five working days to get your test result back and then you can decide what you want to do from then on. The other option which some other people prefer is doing later in the pregnancy which is an amniocentesis which is taking fluid from around the fetus. The risk of miscarriage is lower at one in a thousand but it is that little bit later in pregnancy so it's really up to up to the individual couples what they prefer to do and if any of you are in this position where you are thinking about that you'd like to plan another pregnancy we would say get in contact with us early and we can talk through these options in really great detail with you and give you as much information as you want if you have, weren't planning it and you discover that you are pregnant and you still want to talk through these options that's also okay just let us know and give us a call and we can help this is something that I get asked increasingly amount, a lot about um, as it's becoming more into public awareness, I guess. Um, and that's pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. And so that's using, and that's called PGT, PGD. And it's using IVF to create embryos. So very simply, you take the sperm, you take the egg, you put them together, you grow an embryo for about four days, and then you test the embryo for the known gene change, and you can select then which embryos that you're going to um, put back in for future pregnancies. The costs are not covered by Medicare at this point, hoping that there'll be a Medicare number later in the year, which will at least partially cover the costs of this, um, and that's under discussion, and there's no guarantee of a pregnancy at the end of going through the whole IVF, and the IVF comes at a cost as well. But that is an option for some couples, and if that's what some couples want to do, then they have to come and see us, and we have to write a letter in support. So many of you have gone through this, who are on through line, about feeling about a diagnosis. Sometimes it's a big shock. You weren't expecting it. Maybe we're hoping to come in and we'd say, there's nothing, nothing there. We're not going to do anything further. A grief experience is a really common finding, grieving that what you thought was going to happen or what you expected your life to be like, and that can be a grief for that part of your life. Guilt particularly if you may find out that you are affected as well, that guilt of essentially passing on the condition. Some people think this doesn't change anything, and that's also okay. It doesn't change anything for me. Thank you very much for telling me. Thank you very much for finding the gene change, but what does it actually mean? Anger. <clears throat> Why me? Why has this happened to my family? And shame. All of these things are valid feelings and things that we encounter with on a regular basis within the genetics clinic and are happy to help you explore and go through, or also direct you to people that may be able to help you further. These are things that have come up when we've talked to other families about coping with a genetic diagnosis, particularly in babies and little ones. Um, people are worried about the reactions of friend, family, friends and strangers. The uncertainty and worries about the future, what's the future going to hold? Will my child, when they grow up, need help carrying on? And also how to talk about the diagnosis with the child and others. All these things can help by contacting other parents and others affected with the same condition, which is why Brett is doing such good work in putting everyone together and helping with resources. So these are things we can also help. So even if you have the diagnosis, you can still come and see us and we can help go through this. Um, this is something that we often get asked about, which is talking with children about genetic conditions. 
incorporating gender into self-identity. It's a different but not necessarily worse reality. And information sharing as a continuum. And we sort of go through techniques such as establishing considering words by taking time to prepare your story. You can take control over the story that you choose com to communicate with others. And these are um, different phrases that we use, not necessarily related to Noonan's, but sometimes things that are very obvious that people can see. The recipe for my skin is a bit different, but otherwise I'm just the same. Or well, everyone's different, but one of my differences is I'm a bit shorter. I'm a bit shorter than you because my recipe is different, but I'm just as grown up as you. So giving children this able to, ability to empower them when they're in the playground and giving them phrases that they're ready to say. And that's where I wanted to end. So thank you very much. Any questions? Oh, if, you've got, if you have a question, here's this. Otherwise, the online audience won't hear us. Hi, Rachel. Um, I just okay. wanted to ask a question about the amniocentesis. Yeah. What is the um, like percentage rate of getting an, a, um, a diagnosis of something's wrong with your child when you have that test? Um, so. When we do the amniocentesis, we are looking specifically for the gene change that we know is in the family. Okay. So we'd say there's a 50-50 chance of having yeah. a gene change. When we do, but you have a good, a good point. When we do an amniocentesis, we often also offer an, a test that's looking at the chromosomes as well. Yes. And that's different to what we're looking for in the family with Noonan syndrome. But we might say, do you want us to also look for trisomy 21, trisomy 18, trisomy okay. 13? And that percentage would be very dependent on different factors such as maternal age and things like that. Yeah, because I had an amniocentesis done with my daughter yeah. and it came back saying there was nothing wrong with her yeah. and then she ended up having Noonan syndrome. So Yeah, so unless we know we're looking for... Um, the exact gene change that causes Noonan syndrome, we wouldn't be able to, it's not a screening test. Yeah. So it's really a diagnostic test, knowing for where that recipe changes and being able to hone in and look for it. Beautiful. So one of the questions we had was regarding the PGD IVF. Yep. Someone was asking, with the current methodology, you know, say, say you have 10 embryos and mm -hmm. the PGD IVF yep. recognises half have PTP in 11, for example, yep. Yep. Uh, and the other half don't. Could they use in future some of these new technologies such as CRISPR to edit those five so you now, you now have ten yeah. to work with yeah. as opposed to only having five to work with? Is that yeah, sense? look, I think we're a long way away from using CRISPR technology for genetic changing in embryos. Theoretically, yes, but I don't think that we'll be anywhere near using it in terms of gene changing and um, in embryo selection. Uh, another question we had for you was, do you suspect there are other gene mutations out there responsible for Noonan syndrome that we haven't identified yet? Yes, absolutely. There are some people that come through our clinic that we're absolutely clinically very sure have the condition Noonan syndrome. And as to, I suspect there are more genes, I suspect there are non-coding regions, so those bits in between the recipes that are actually causing the condition that we just don't know how to interpret and how to test for. Okay. Um, and then lastly, Will there ever be a gene replacement therapy for Noonan's like Zalingzema works for <coughs> spinal muscular atrophy? Um, I, look, I, I'm not really sure about the gene replacement, whether that would be... We know this pathway is the rhizopathy pathway and the RAS-MPK pathway, and there are specific therapies that kind of hone in on different parts of the pathways that are being developed. That's probably more likely, so probably kind of repurposing therapy that we know is already available and that the drugs are relatively safe that work on that pathway is more likely than actually gene therapy in terms of cost, in terms of benefit. Does that, does that make sense? I can probably go back. Yes, come I just have one more question as well. Yeah. Um, if you, your child has Noonan syndrome, gets a diagnosis of Noonan syndrome, and then both of the parents get testing and it comes back as negative, so yeah. neither of you get it and child it's a sporadic, is there a chance that um, it can miss a generation? So like one of the parents' grandparents could have it yeah. and then one of the parents be a carrier but not particularly show... In the test. So in that scenario, no, um, it can't really skip a generation. If it's not with you, it stops. It could be so you're so mildly affected that you don't know. But if you've identified the gene change, the gram, and it's not going to miss. Like if you don't have it, you don't have it. What can happen in the scenario, um, and this is what we. Can
counsel people for is that we say if you have one child who has Noonan syndrome and you have the genetic change, neither of the parents have the genetic change, your chance is still about 1% of having a child in the future. And I'm giving you kind of a genetics 101, <laughs> but Muted. this is due to a chance of... Um, Unmuted. Oh, uh, mosaicism in the ovaries or sperm. So that gene change is only present in the ovaries or sperm. So the chance of having another child in Noonan syndrome would still be there. But that's really rare, which is why we push the chance right down to 1%. If, if parents, sorry, yeah. That's one scenario. Yeah, so it's rare, but it, it happens. <laughs> And so that can happen as a, a one-off, or it could happen that it's in the sperm or the eggs, um, and that's germline mosaicism. So that change is just there. We can't test for that, but we know that it can possibly happen. So it, it means that if you have a child who is affected and you want an, and you're expecting another child, we can still offer testing if you would like in the pregnancy because of that 1% chance, but it's really about whether you want to undergo a procedure for that small chance or whether you want to continue. And that's a discussion that we have. And some parents say, I don't want to take that 1% chance, I want to know. And that's also okay. Um, I'm just diagnosed about 13 years ago, and I know you're talking about the facial recognition stuff that you're doing now. Um, are, are you interested in um, seeking photos of um, children who have been diagnosed in the past? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah awesome. that'd be very helpful. So do we just go about contacting the genetic yeah, counselling? Um, yeah, so if you, we, can give you, uh, we can give you contact details. Awesome. Yeah, or Colin okay. can pass on to me, and then um, Lynn, who's the person who takes the photos, would be in contact. If that's yeah. great, that'd be really helpful. It wasn't around when, yeah. uh, obviously, we had it done yeah. um, previously, so... Yeah, it's really the last few years that we... And we we're still trying to build the database so that we can do computer teaching to teach the computer to be able to recognise. Awesome. OK, thank, thank you. you. Do you want photos? Um, we'd have to take them with our own camera because it's a 3D camera. But yeah, yeah, yeah we'd love people. That would be great. I've been to your service. Yeah. I don't know because I was so with diagnosed three. Yeah. I don't like the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it would probably only be a couple of years ago that we started collecting okay, photos. So should I get in contact? Yeah, or, yeah, or just if Colin knows everyone, he can pass on the details. If you're happy for us to contact you to arrange a time, that would be great. So in, in the clinic, uh, uh, quite often we do have the genetic photographer oh, come to the yep. clinic and she'll catch the people yep. that are coming to the clinic, but um, you can always make contact with us through Brett or through yeah. myself, so that's always very useful. I I had a quick question um, to ask, which is maybe more of a comment than a question. The field of genetics seems to change so quickly and new discoveries are, seem to be made every week, which is quite anxiety provoking for clinicians that they might be missing out on stuff. And we're obviously we're guided with the specialists uh, like yourself as to know what genetic uh, new tests are available. Um, I guess the question I wanted to ask is how uh, much is information shared in in geneticists, and how how can we make sure that we've always got the best, most up to date test available <laughs> for different conditions here? Uh, and that might be a bit of a philosophical question, but it's still one I'd like to ask. Yeah. So, um, in terms of whether you get the most up to date test, what we do say to people is that um, if we if we found the molecular diagnosis the first time, we don't need to update it. That, that's there. The gene change is there. We've found it. We don't need to keep repeating that. If we haven't found a molecular change, but we still have the diagnosis or we don't have a diagnosis, we say come back and see us in at least two years' time and we'll see what updated testing is available then. Unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to go back through everyone's notes without an appointment to be able to go through and see who hasn't had a diagnosis. So we do say our door is open. Call us in two years' time. We'll make an appointment. We'll review what we know. We'll review if we can offer any more information. Even, I mean, the, the field is still going to move further and further into terms of what we can offer. And I think just by contacting us and saying, oh, am I all doing the right test? Am I getting there? Is the best answer. 
Um, I just wanted to add, um, I knew that my, so my partner has um, the LZTR1 gene, we discovered that through my daughter's genetic journey, um, so I knew I had a 50% chance of my child um, having the gene. I chose not to have a CVS or amnio um, because it wasn't going to affect the outcome of my pregnancy, but what I did do, which was I thought was fantastic, was I had the cord blood tested mm -hmm. as soon as the baby was born, so I was able to find out whether he was affected as soon as possible but also didn't have to go through the trauma of having a baby having yeah. blood taken so um when when uh i th the nurses at the the midwives at the pregnant uh, at the birthing were actually quite fascinated by that concept it doesn't happen very often i don't think but just um for other people who are thinking of another pregnancy that is a a good option as well yeah that's a really good point thank you no worries. Um, and on that um so the, the way we discovered my partner had the gene was my daughter has another genetic disorder, but the geneticist looked at her and said, you look like you might have Noonan's as well. And I was like, oh, fantastic, two genetic disorders, thank you very much. Um, but she was tested and they didn't identify the gene, but they identified it in my partner. Um, is there a possibility in that situation that she could actually have that mutation, but they didn't find it in that particular test? They so identified. Sorry, I just go back. They identified yeah, the gene change. <laughs> they identified the gene change in your partner, yes. but not her. No, because we know what we're looking for. Yeah, yeah. Because the geneticist did suggest retesting, but yeah. I didn't know whether they were going to be looking for a different Noonan's gene. They probably the be looking time. for a different. Okay, a different gene. All right, and then just on the LZTO one as well. Um, is it true that I think it can, there is genetic um, autosomal recessive? Yeah, that can cause schwannomatosis as well. Okay. Is there any other questions at all? No? Oh, yes. Sorry. So just, um, I may have missed it, you may have already said this already, but so if, you, if your child's diagnosed with a specific gene change um, and you test for that specific gene change in the parents and it comes back negative, can a parent have a different gene change of Noonan syndrome that they perhaps haven't tested for? So you might have um, the BRAF, but yeah. then your child might end up getting SOS1. <clears throat> yeah, so it'd probably be quite... So I suppose in that scenario, we would be looking at the parents and saying, do they fit the clinical criteria as to whether we look further into other um, genes that cause Noonan syndrome. If we found it in the child and the parents don't have any clinical signs and they don't have it in the parents, I think we'd be quite comfortable saying we don't have to do more. I'm just asking only because when my daughter was diagnosed, she's 10 uh, and she got diagnosed nine years ago, just mm -hmm. before she turned one, uh, she got diagnosed with SOS-1, but took them 11 months to find the gene and when they found it, they tested um, her father and I, and we both came back negative, but before, like, before the testing, the doctors and the geneticists that we had both looked at my partner and said, we think you've got it, because he's got all of the facial okay. features that yep. look the same, he's got yep. the droopy eyelids, yep. um, him, my daughter look identical, mm. plus in his family he's got the blood clotting problems okay. and the blood yep. thinning problems, heart conditions, the chronic limb pain, like a lot of mm. the signs, a lot of the medical issues mm. that Sienna has, um, he has as well, but he yep. came back testing negative. Because they only tested for the change. As far in, as I can yeah. tell, he was only so tested for I suppose if, we, if you still have clinical concerns, it's just that he gets a referral mm. as a standalone because we see adults as well and then we could pot potentially decide should we be doing further testing yeah and for because him. it was like nine years ago i imagine you've got a yeah. lot better testing yeah. oh yes absolutely. that yeah. could test for other genetic yeah. changes as well yep yeah. so yeah so if he wants to get a referral from his gp be very happy to see him in fantastic clinic. thank you it's all good okay. thank, thank you, you. No, thank you.